Good morning, and welcome to our worship service on this eighth day after Pentecost. The Greeks have a way of saying it with two verbs, and I admit this morning I can't remember what those words are. Those things have leaked out of my head. But I, can, I know what I, I'm thinking and feeling, and I know what the Greek words stand for. It's those times when you're happy and sad at the same time. And that's what I'm feeling this morning. I'm sad that this was my last time to drive down here 75 miles on a Sunday morning to come and be with you. Uh, but I'm happy at the same time that uh, I will be sitting in Peace Lutheran Church and seeing the friends that I got divorced from 13 months, months ago that my wife has been able to visit my entire time that I've been gone for 13 months, but I haven't been able to see my friends after 41 years to be separated for 13 months. 
So I'm looking forward to that and a lot of lunches after church. I'm looking forward to that over the next weeks. Uh, and at the same time, as I've told you, I'm, I'm going to stop in from time to time and check on you and sit with you side by side and, and worship with you. And right now, if, if you really get desperate to see me again soon, August 20th, I'll be in Corvallis covering for Pastor Tembrell. And I'm praying he doesn't take the call to Wilmot, Wisconsin, because I don't really want to drive there every Sunday for however many months are coming up in the near future. So I'm praying that he stays here. Please arise and let us begin our worship of our Lord. We worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And let us join together in the first two verses of We Now Implore God the Holy Ghost. We now implore God the Holy Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins, and I do so in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us continue with verses 3 and 4. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy and to bring forth fruits in faith and hope and love. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading this morning, first of all, triggers a memory in my brain because of how often we sang a wonderful song with the Cascade Lutheran Chorale. Uh, Portland area, some people from Salem even came up and joined us for that choir. They came from the Hood River and the Dalles area and obviously from Vancouver and sang the song to remind ourselves of God's promise of how his word will be effective if we just use it and listen to it here on this earth. Isaiah talks about the metaphor with water, precipitation, rain and snow. Our gospel lesson this morning, will, which will also be the sermon, talks about it as seed and a farmer, that God will use his word to bring people to the knowledge that he loves them and cares for them and sent his son to die for their sins so we can be in his heavenly home. Isaiah says it this way in verses 10 and 11 of, verse 50, of chapter 55 this morning. Just as the rain and the snow come down from the sky... And do not return there unless they first water the earth, make it give birth, and cause it to sprout, so that it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. In the same way, my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty. Rather, it will accomplish whatever I please, and it will succeed in the purpose for which I sent it. Here ends the Old Testament lesson. Let us join together in singing Psalm 1. The epistle lesson I'm going to add to this morning and go further than the verse 25 that is printed for you this morning because of how special this portion of God's word is to me. I don't know when I thought it for the first time, but I know when I thought it big time. God, what's wrong with you? How come you let this happen? The big time was when I was a sophomore in college and the dean called me out of history class to tell me my father had died at home. And as I got in my Mustang and 
headed from Watertown back to the south side of Milwaukee, I had those thoughts. I'm studying to be a minister. How can you let this happen to me? I challenged God. Not the smartest thought I've ever had in my life, but I had it. And in my ministry, I know many times when I've gone to a hospital to see a member who has been told, you've got this type of cancer, or, why, or they were in a car wreck, or something else, and I knew they were thinking one of two things. Either they did something wrong that God caused this to do, get them sort of like karma, or God wasn't really loving them. And so these words from Paul to the Romans when he says, God does not sit there with a button and watch us, or two buttons. Oh, blessing. Oh, problem. Blessing, problem based on my or your behavior. There are times when he does something. You know, if you read Exodus and the children of Israel in the wilderness, there are times blessing, curse, blessing, curse, snakes, <laughs> sometimes, because they have gone too far. But it's not a daily, every moment quid pro quo. And Paul reminds us, as he said to the Romans, for I conclude that our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that it's going to be revealed to us. In fact, creation is waiting with eager longing for the sons of man to be revealed. For creation was subjected to futility, not by its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in the hope that even creation itself will be set free from slavery to corruption in order to share in the glorious freedom of the children of God. For we know that all of creation is groaning with birth pains right up to the present time. And not only creation, but also we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We groan inwardly while we eagerly await our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Indeed, it was for this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, because who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for something we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with patient endurance. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we should pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that are not expressed in words. And he who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to God's will. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. Because those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Here ends the epistle lesson. The verse for the day is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14. Alleluia. The word is very near you, it is in your mouth, and is in your heart so that you may obey it. Alleluia. <laughs> Continue our worship with the hymn, Speak, O Savior, I Am Listening.
Let me get this down by the time I quit. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text upon which we base our meditation today is in Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse 1. That same day Jesus left the house and was sitting by the sea. A large crowd gathered around him. So he stepped into a boat and sat down while all the people stood on the shore. He told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. As he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil. Immediately the seed sprang up because the soil was not deep. But when the sun rose, the seed was scorched. Because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns grew up and choked it, but some seed fell on good ground and produced grain, some 100 times, some 60, some 30 times more than was sown. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. So listen carefully to the parable of the sower. When anyone, anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the person that was sown along the path. The seed that was sown on rocky ground is the person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he's not deeply rooted and does not endure. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed that was sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it produces no fruit. But the seed that was sown on the good ground is the one who continues to hear and understand the word. Indeed, he continues to produce fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times more than was sown. This is God's word. Dear friends in Christ, this parable brings to mind a Sunday school teacher I had at Resurrection Lutheran Church on the south side of Milwaukee. I can't remember her name. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a while. I have her face in mind, and I also remember that she caused a scandal in our congregation at Resurrection Lutheran Church. Because back in the 60s, she was one of the first women to wear slacks. Yeah. She had to be dealt with. Yeah. No. <laughs> well, and, and to top it off, she already was married and had children and was wearing slacks. So, oh, that just added to it. I remember, these are the things you remember, you know, when like you're 10 years old, 11 years old, and the adults talking back and forth about some stupid things. What I remember about her is when she would teach. I don't know if this was part of her lesson plan or not, but it's sort of what she did most of the time. Before jumping just right into the story, and especially like a story like this, the parable, which she thought maybe at fifth and sixth grade we had heard at least once before. Instead of just jumping to the story and reading it, or we read it, take turns reading and then asking questions like we got it, she would pause and start with other things. And like with the parable, ask that obvious question, what's a parable? So we, like all good Lutheran kids, had it memorized. It's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Okay, we got that down. But then she would ask in a more serious way, but still just right out there and obvious, who is the speaker of this story? Who's telling this story? There was no one answer because the obvious answer is Jesus, but she wanted more than that. She wanted five, six answers before she would go on. Jesus, the, the one who loves us. Jesus, the one who died on the cross. Jesus, the one who lived the perfect life. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, the one we pray to at night when we go to bed. Jesus, the one that taught us the prayer that starts our Father. Jesus, that is in heaven watching over us and sending his angels to take care of us. Jesus is the one who wants us to be in heaven with him, and he's going to do what he can to help us get there. And at least we had to have like 10 or 12 answers before she said, okay, now let's go on with the story and listen to what Jesus has to say today. I'm assuming that most of you know the story. Most of you know the parable. And I think of this parable having like two levels of meaning. The basic thing that Jesus wanted to get across to the disciples and those of us today is how God's word is received. And just acknowledging the reality. As we preach God's word, as we share God's word, as we listen to God's word, 
that the reality is that some of that word accomplishes sort of nothing. It's seed in the farmer's story where it hits the path. It doesn't do anything except give some food to the birds who pick it up and eat it. It doesn't seem to accomplish anything. And the obvious lesson is that that is what happens in life then too. Do you know anybody that you've talked to about your faith that is like that soil? That you talk about your faith, you talk about your hopes, you talk about your future in heaven and just doing, doing, doing. Just seems to bounce off their head and doesn't seem to do anything. And sometimes I know if you're like me, you're tempted to give up on them and say, well, they're just that hard-packed path. It doesn't pay, pay to keep witnessing to them, so we'll just give up. And I acknowledge to myself and then say to you, don't, don't. And I'll tell you why in a little bit. The other soil, the next soil that he has, is the, the, the rocky soil, the rocky ground. The person who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he's not deeply rooted and does not endure. When trouble and persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. I've been around long enough to try to talk to people even of other churches than my own and hear sinful things like, you know, my, when my daughter had a miscarriage, she stopped going to church and I don't know how to get her back. Ever since my husband was disabled at work, he doesn't think there is a God. That is the reality. And trying to get people to think like Paul was trying to get people to think in that simple epistle lesson today, that God did not just punish Adam and Eve for their original sin, but he cursed the planet. And so we have the same problem. Christians have the same problems as unbelievers as far as stuff happening to us that is bad. And that can mess up our faith from time to time. I also think of these words when I think of somebody calling me and saying, I don't go to your church, but would you baptize my baby? And in my mind, I'm saying, are you trying to get grandma off your back? Because <laughs> I know that's what usually call, <laughs> produces the phone call. I said, I'll be happy to do that if you let me talk to you for an hour. And most people are willing. Uh, what, is there any other cost? No, you let me talk to you for an hour. <laughs> Baptisms are free, but you have to listen to me for an hour. And usually they're willing to do that to get the baptism. But one of the things I tell them with baptism is not just that it is an awesome sacrament of God and gives the gift of faith and forgives sins to little children and babies as well as adults, which remind me, I, I always take pleasure in when I, when I baptize my girls when they were little. No matter how good a teacher or preacher I am, I'm not going to get through them as much as what the Holy Spirit can do through his simple gift of faith. But I also tell them, think of it like in springtime, especially in the Pacific Northwest. You till up a garden, you plant your seed, you put it at the right depth, separate the rows correctly, you water it one time, and then you don't do anything till the end of August. What are your expectations? Especially in the Pacific Northwest where it doesn't rain for three months. Baptism, a wonderful gift from God, but if you don't nurture it, if you don't continue to water it and feed it, it is not once baptized, always saved. If it were, then I'd get a hold of Gordon Peters, and I'd say, okay, Gordon, tell me which of the planes where you park your plane is a crop duster, because what I'm going to do is get that guy with the crop duster to fill his tanks with all pure water, and some Saturday in fall, we're going to fly over Beaver and Duck Stadiums and yell out in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we'll have 120,000 conversions, in, except for the Christians that are probably already there, if that's how it worked. Jesus says it does work, but it also reminds us in other places it needs to be fed. The third... See, that was sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but the worry of this world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, and it produces no fruit. Let 
Matthew Swanson. The other religions in the Pacific Northwest are not your challenge. It is the mountains and the ocean. It is Sunday soccer and a few other things <laughs> as you get ready to do ministry in the Pacific Northwest. I'm not challenged by Catholics or Mormons. I can deal with them. But soccer on Sunday mornings, that's tough. That's a hard battle I haven't always won. What's more important? And the same thing can be said for so many other, other idols in this world. It's not understand, hard to understand what Jesus was talking about there that became more important than going to church, listening to God's word, being edified by somebody who's telling you about God and, and what he is and who he is and what he's done for us. Because there are so many more things that are attractive out there in the world. And then the last one. The seed that was sown on the good ground and the one who continues to hear and understand it, he continues to produce fruit. Some hundred, some sixty, and some thirty times more than was sown. Why well, I say there's sort of a two-level application to this text today is because sometimes what can happen is we think, or may apply it, that each person is one of these seeds. Like I said at the beginning, I said that you know, there are people that seem where it bounces off, bounces off, bounces off, and you might as well just quit be, and shake that dust off your feet and say, we don't worry, we're not going to waste our time on that anymore because this is what they are. And the people that get choked down by problems or choked by the blessings, well, that's what happens, that's the way it is. Don't worry, we can't worry about them or do anything about them either. So let's give up on them. Let's just hang out with the people that are producing fruit. That would be Calvinist, and I don't want to go in that direction. I'm still a Lutheran. We are not typecast. People are not typecast. We are not just one of these. As I'm reminded, of, as I preach this word again to myself today, I am. I am all four of these types of soil. Jesus doesn't talk directly to people. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. I put it in my father's words. You got wax in your ears, son? Do I need to interpret? What was my father's message when he sort of asked that question? You're not listening to me. If you're listening to me, you're not hearing. If you're hearing and listening to me, you're still not doing what I want you to do. You got wax in your ears, son. Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let him hear. My father understood this parable and its application to church. Because every Sunday on the way home from church, I got tested. Tell me two things you remember from the sermon today, Gary. Do you ever daydream in church? Or was I the only one that did that once in a while when I was little? And I would squint to see if I could get the candles get to get taller. Or I'd look at the tiles on the floor to see how you could make a checkerboard out of them because ours had two different colors. Am I the only one that sat that way in church once in a while when they were young? So my dad's solution was, tell me two things. And I learned after a while, get two things from the beginning of the sermon in case... He says, amen, too soon. So that was my practical way of dealing with my father, my dad's practical way of getting me to listen. I think of the other two soils. The hardly rooted and the getting choked by the, the wealth of the, the world. It reminds me of a proverb where he prays to God, do not give me poverty or riches. Do not give me poverty or riches. Give me food in the amount that is right for me. Too much and I may feel satisfied and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Too little and I may, be, I may become poor and steal and profane the name of my God. If you're like me, you ask God to keep your problems to a minimum. Keep them small, infrequent, easy to deal with.
But maybe you've never prayed for small blessings instead of big ones. Maybe you've never prayed for minimum good things to happen in your life and ask God to keep you away from large blessings. I don't pray that often, just when I'm reminded of this text. But I do pray it, because I've seen it happen, where people had too big a problem and it, it did take them away from their relationship with God, and they had too many blessings and that took them away from their relationship with God. And so I think about that with this problem today, that yes, help me with my problems and help me with my surplus so that my relationship with you, God, stays sure. A couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, I told you, I know it's harder for you to sit there than it is for me to stand up here. I mean, you don't have to prepare to come and sit there. I've got to prepare to say something. But I'm thinking about what's going to happen to me next week when I have to sit in the pew and listen to somebody else talk. That's going to take work. It takes work on your half, behalf to get the wax out of your ears and listen. That's why we got a parable like this, that Jesus understood that. Even in a situation where he's in a boat and they're standing on the shore. You just got a mess because you're under construction. But they stood on the shore and listened to Jesus because they knew who he was and, and, and where his heart was. But next week I'm thinking, what do I need to do to make sure that I do the right job. Well, I'm getting prepared. So that I behave well, I have my Cheerios, and I have my, oh no. Good thing those weren't crayons. I got colored pencils, so that I do not annoy my wife, who hasn't had to sit next to me for many, many years. I'm ready. I'm ready. But it will be different. I can truthfully say, for 42 years, I knew exactly what the pastor was going to say before he said it. <laughs> Nobody's going to call me a liar on that. I know exactly what I'm going to say before I say it. Next week, I won't. And I'll say, well, I won't say it that way. I would have said it this way. Well, I hope I don't get critical. I hope I don't get bothered, and I hope and I pray that I ask God to help me enjoy that it's the same word is said in a different way than maybe I would have said it. And since I'm still going to say it to myself, I sort of get twice his way of saying it and my way of thinking I would have said it. That can't hurt me. That will bless me. Because as that Sunday school teacher made me think, no matter if I'm preaching, Pastor Swanson starts preaching, Pastor Janish, who I'll be listening to in the near future, what are they speaking to us? Words from God. Trying to get us to understand it through our English way of speaking, but they're still going to be speaking the words from God. And who is this? The same answers we gave to that Sunday school teacher. A God who loves us and cares for us. A God wants us to be in his heavenly home. Who loved us so much he sent his son to die for our sins and Jesus willingly got on that cross to get punished for stuff that I did wrong so I won't have to get punished for that. And I get to live where? For how long? And the best part in my brain is I will be young again. You young people don't understand that glory yet. Us older people understand what it would be like to be 22 again. Shortstop, playing softball, golfing and hit a ball, hit a drive more than 150 yards. I mean, all these things. Simple things. Very simple things. But to enjoy everybody and we all get along with one another? Even on Facebook? Will that be boring? I don't think so. I don't think so. 
And so I think of that again with the simple words today of using my ears to hear what Jesus wants me to hear. He loves me. He cares for me. He wants the best for me. And he wants me to have an awesome, happily ever after. That's the God you and I worship. That's the God who's worthy of worship and our praise and our telling our friends and family and even strangers who he is and what he wants to do for us and share the word with them too. Let's do it even when it's frustrating once in a while. Because it's awesome when somebody responds. It's awesome when somebody responds the right way and you get to see the joy in their hearts and in their minds and on their face and in their worship. It's wonderful. It is for me too when I come to church and knowing that this is all true. This is all really true. Amen. Please arise. May the love of God, which he has for you and for me, which goes beyond our understanding, keep your hearts and your minds focused on Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us join together in professing our Christian faith today using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Having gathered our offering, let us please bring it forward and let us join together in verses 1 and 3 of Lord of All Good. Let us continue with prayer. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, we praise and worship you again today for all the kindness and goodness you have shown to us, your children. Purely because of your great love for us, you have adopted us to be your own. You have poured out your Holy Spirit on us that we might know you. You have opened our hearts and minds to hear and understand your word and have been transformed, and you have transformed us by it. Almighty God, your word is cast like seed into the ground. Now let the dew of heaven descend and righteous fruits abound. O Lord, Satan and the world around us do all they can to silence and remove your word. It is disparaged as something irrelevant for the world in which we now live. In some places it is banned as those who oppose you work overtime to keep people ignorant of your truth and love. Perhaps the most pernicious evil is when those who present themselves as your servants proclaim that which is the opposite of what you have revealed. And yet, they do not fully succeed. New souls continue to be brought into your kingdom. We therefore pray, let not the foe of Christ and man the whole seed remove, but give it root in every heart to bring forth fruits of love. 
O Holy Spirit, life in this world with its worries and cares, with its distractions and difficulties, will always be working to choke out that faith which you plant in the hearts of your saints. Preserve us from this danger. Rescue those who have been trapped by it, that they may take hold of the life that is truly life, and by their lives be your salt and light in the world. Let not the world's deceitful cares the rising plant destroy, but let it yield a hundredfold the fruits of peace and joy. Lord of the Church, your people are scattered throughout the world, and sometimes the groups in which they come together as small as two or three. Whether our numbers are many or few, do not let us become discouraged by the challenges we face. You have promised that you will bless your word wherever it is proclaimed. Enable us to hold to that promise as we carry our, on our work here. Give that same confidence to all of your people everywhere. Parents raising their children, teachers instructing their students, pastors leading their congregations, missionaries taking your word to places near and far, friends sharing their faith with others. Whenever the precious seed is sown, life-giving grace bestowed that all whose souls the truth receive, its saving power may know. And hear us, Lord, as we take a half minute to bring you our private petitions. These and all our prayers we bring before you, confident that you will hear and answer them, because our Savior has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Be seated, and Peter Doran will lead us, or not lead us, but sing the song People Get Ready.
Uh, there's a, a, a backstory to that song that we should share with you. Uh, a few weeks ago, several of us were uh, trying to come up with what might be an appropriate gift to, uh, to give to, to Pastor Cracklow for his uh, diligent sharing of the gospel with us for these last uh, many, many months. A um, few more than you intended, maybe even we intended. But, it was another uh, vicar year. <laughs> <laughs> but the, as usual, the Lord uh, has worked things out pretty nicely. Um, so at any rate, thinking about this gift, um, we uh, didn't want it to involve Burger King or, or <laughs> Mountain Dew. Um, so we, we asked, we asked they Lynn. Listen, they listen to what I say. <laughs> <laughs> we, we asked Lynn, uh, his wife, who's here today, um, what his loves were. What are the things that would be important to him? And she reaffirmed, of course, that sharing the gospel uh, it was something you'll, you'll do first and foremost, and whether you're retired or not. Um, also, he loves music, um, loves trains, too, maybe much more so than school buses. <laughs> <laughs> or than the school bus. And as far as, like, colors, he likes blues, shades of blue, I guess. So we put all that stuff in a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> and what came out was a famous gospel song from 1962 by a rhythm and blues artist <laughs> whose name was Curtis Mayfield. Um, great song, and if this was a good gift, we would have had Curtis Mayfield come and sing it for you, <laughs> instead of me. Uh, however, um, Curtis Mayfield wasn't Wells, <laughs> and he also took the train to Jordan some time ago. Um, <laughs> So, given that, we decided to memorialize the gift in a different way uh, than just with the song. So we commissioned, um, let's see if I can get over here. We commissioned a local quilter, who I know pretty well, um, to, to prepare this quilt. And so with the help of uh, the expert uh, screen printing talents of uh, Rex and Angie Middlestead, we prepared this quilt, and as you will see, it's going to be blue. Um, it's going to involve the gospel, and it's going to involve a train. And I think it's going to involve everything we said it should, including music. Because if you look at that, that's the front, and on the back, flip it over, there is an image of a train. Here, I can help you. It's an image of the train with the lyrics of the first verse of that song. People get ready, there's a train coming. Uh, reminding you always that uh, our gift is the free ride to heaven. We don't pay for it, we don't bring our baggage there. Uh, so... <laughs> Well, that's all I got. <laughs> so I said it would be a, a sad day and, and a happy day, yeah, too. So thank you. Thank you. Announcements? No more speeches, just announcements. <laughs> I'm not going to waste my breath following thank something you. like thank that. You. Um, what I have been told, though, I could have some announcements, but the food's ready to. Uh, follow the practice they have in Portland, which Gary's going to be familiar with, is we're going to have a metering program. In other words, we're going to say the prayers for the meal up here. We'll have Pastor Crackle lead us in that. And as we usher people out and they have to go past him, that will automatically slow down the line going past the food so we can get through nice and orderly. Uh, the pattern for that is, as you get into the fellowship hall, go to the left, go through the small door, go past all the desserts. You can't take those first, kids. Go, go past the desserts. Uh, the food is in the hallway, then you come back into the fellowship hall and find the place where you want to sit. And so, I have mine yet. Okay. okay. Let's join together in our two common table Bob, prayers. Before we do that. Oh, Bob has something. Before we do that, please. I have two things. First, the reminder of the golf tournament on September 10th. 
And the second thing is, Kaylee, would you come up here, please? In keeping with tradition, we have a birthday. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how old she is. She's too close to me right now, and I don't want to get hurt. So let's sing. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Kaylee. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. And the obvious is that 4 o'clock this afternoon, Pastor Swanson will be installed as your new pastor. And that will also have a dinner after that. So pace yourself for lunch, because there's, there's more to come. Uh, let us join together in prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. We'll give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Amen.